Welcome to this environmental studies and systems revision video for topic four and today we're looking at 4.1 introduction to water systems. I've split this part of the topic into two, uh, the hydrological cycle i.e. the water cycle and then ocean currents which will be the second video. So what do you need to know? You need to know there is something called the Earth's water budget and this is the idea of how much fresh water is available for um, the people of the people of the earth to use and obviously animals and biodiversity as well. Um, we know water is absolutely essential. One of the reasons water is essential is it acts as something called a solvent. So it allows things to dissolve into your body and the chemical reactions in your body to take place. Now, as you'll be aware, the earth is a blue planet. However, within the earth, there is very little actual fresh water. So only about 3% of the earth's water is fresh. And a lot of that is frozen away in glaciers and ice. So therefore, only one to even less than 1% of water is available for us to drink. So the water budget is a quantitative estimate of the amounts of water in storages and flows of the water cycle, which therefore make them available for. Um, as I said, fresh water, 68% is found as ice caps and glaciers, 30% in groundwater and 0.3% in pond rivers, uh, pond rivers and uh, lakes. So therefore, out of that total 3%, that makes up um, fresh water. So fresh water, remember, is only 3% of the total water on the planet. There is less than 68, sorry, there's about 30%-ish that is available to drink. The atmosphere only actually holds about 0.001% of the total volume of water as well. Okay, so the other thing you need to know is that there is something called water turnover time. So this is going to affect the availability of water and where we use water up. So in aquifers, for example, where we take the water out of the ground, it will give us the idea of well, how long will water take to reproduce or re replenish itself. And because of this, you can consider water as both a uh, renewable resource or a non-renewable resource because it depends where you're taking this water from. So if we're taking this water um, from a, if we look at non-renewable first, okay, so imagine we're looking at non-renewable, okay, these ones here are gonna be non-renewable. We cannot replace the water if we took it out of the ice caps, the ice and the permafrost is gonna be there, it's gonna take 10,000 years to replace it, that's gonna take 2,500 years, that's gonna take that long, that's gonna take that long, okay. To be renewable, it needs to be replenished faster than we we actually need it um, so it can balance the amount that we're using so renewable really rivers can be classed as renewable okay biological water i'm not really sure that is can be classed as that uh, atmospheric moisture can be classed as it, it rains regularly and depending on how much you use you could potentially argue that these ones are renewable as well so it can be either non-renewable, i.e. it'll take so long to replenish, it won't um, replenish within our lifetime, or it is renewable, which means we can get, as we use it up, it is self-replenished by the app. So just to remind you about systems, because that's going to come up in the next few bits. So the hydrological cycle is a system. A system is a way of visualising a complex set of inter um, interrelated parts and how they work together. Systems can be open, which for example would be a forest or an ecosystem, closed, which could be the earth, or isolated, which is the universe. If you're not sure about that, go to the module one videos. Um, and basically in a system, material and energy can be transferred from one form to another, and it can also be stored away. And we represent transformation using um, arrows. So like here, you can see energy is being transferred from the sun, and then it is stored in the producer which is the box. And you could be asked to draw systems for any part of the course um, in environmental studies and systems. So we need to know about the hydrological cycle. You need to talk your way through this cycle and the key parts of it. So if you start in the ocean, which is generally the place I would always start talking about, and what happens is the water in the ocean um, is heated up by the sun. So this whole system is driven by is driven by the um, energy from the sun 
the water evaporates so it goes into water vapor into the clouds um, and that is where it's stored as the air rises it cools so water vapor um, that is in the air starts to condense and it forms clouds when those clouds get too large and the droplets get too heavy the clouds uh, the water then falls as either snow rain or precipitation that water then can do a number of things it can cause runoff and go into the rivers and then go to the rivers back to the sea um, it can do infiltration which is where it goes into the ground um, and then percolation as it goes through the ground now hydrological cycle as I said is a system because material and energy go into the system and they are transformed in the system so water starts off as a liquid in the in the um, in the ocean it becomes a gas in the sky and then it could become a liquid it could become a solid depending on how it falls um, in whether it's snow uh, hail or um, water as it falls down the liquid the water is also stored in different places so things like we just showed about whether it's renewable or not the storage of water is um, going to be stored in the clouds for a certain amount of time it's going to be stored in lakes for a certain amount of time it gets stored in the oceans it gets stored in aquifers so water is stored in um, in the hydrologic places so um, you need to be able to talk about these different things okay and you need to be able to identify um, ways that water is transferred so water is transferred as I just said then through a few different mechanisms so the wind transfers water from one place to another blowing the water across the land water is transferred through flooding across the land water is transferred due to surface runoff infiltration or percolation which is when it goes into the ground water is transferred through the flow of water in streams and rivers and in the sea and oceans through currents um, water is transformed from transpiration where water is evaporated so it goes from water form to gas form from the implants water is frozen which means it is going from a liquid to a solid and it becomes snow or ice and water um, vapor can cool down and turn back into water in the clouds which is condensation just be aware of these two words um hopefully pretty obvious but just to highlight it to you transferred means taken from one place to another transformed means it's changing state from a um, solid to a liquid uh, to a gas okay so when we're talking about uh, it being transformed it's transforming its uh, state from a solid to a liquid to a gas or obviously if the temperature is going down backwards as well so here's just another picture that you might be um, you could use to revise from a lot more of the key words are in here so the water evaporates the water then um, cools down um, and it starts to condensate in the clouds when they get too heavy precipitation occurs that water then can do surface runoff back into the rivers or into the sea or it can do infiltration and percolation in, into the land and then through the rocks back to the sea that way trees also absorb water into the through the roots and then evaporate water from the leaves which is called transpiration and if you remember that links directly to rainforests and why rainforests have their wet climate that they do because they produce their own water so what are the human impacts then as per usual in this course we've got to look at that so the human impacts are um, basically what what do we actually do so if we look at the things basically we can do one or two things to the water cycle or the hydrological cycle and that is we can withdraw water or we can add water things back into the water so we can take it out which is withdrawal or we can add pollution back in so basically these are different ways we withdraw water in terms of sectors so um, thermoelectrical i.e using um, water in power stations um, is a main way of taking water out 41 percent agriculture around the world uses up a lot of water different industry uh, domestic and public uses what we use at home and then direct just for livestock or aquaculture which is fishing and um, growing uh, fish 
that uses only 3%. And obviously we had lots of pollutants potentially back into the water, which could also just include um, warm water because warm water holds less um, oxygen. So um, if we have a look at it, we can um, have quite an impact on water storage and water transfers directly in the water cycle. So rather than focusing on pollution, um, so change, one thing that we can do in the water cycle is we can change the flow speed and the route of water. Now we do this by building canals, which are obviously artificial waterways to maybe direct water in different pathways back to sea to stop towns and cities flooding or to help irrigate, um, irrigate crops. So Road building can also lead to water um, changing routes. We might build tunnels under the roads, direct rivers in different ways to stop the roads flooding. Building canals, as I said, and think about um, in Egypt with the Gerd Dam, you've got dams, you've got reservoirs that can be built and that can cause um, significant direction changes or storage route changes or speed changes in water flow. And there you can see the um, a dam there, I think that is the good dam, that obviously has massively slowed the flow of water in that area. Um, we can also make divert. We can also divert rivers, um, and that could be for different reasons. It could be positive or negative. It could be to create a new habitat, so a wetland, for example, and that could have very little impact on the original river. Or it could be to create a reservoir, um, and those different things um, could, as a result, um, have positive or negative impacts. But we can divert rivers. Um, Generally, the human impact on the water cycle is not good. So you could be given data, you could be given information about this. So here you can see the two ones that I think are likely to come up in exams where they would give you data is the Aral Sea. And this has been depleted through intense irrigation. So this I think could be linked to topic eight as well. Um, and you can see here the sea's depletion over years and years and years because they've used it, all the water, in the, not direct from the sea, but from the river flow that goes into the water. So basically the, the rivers have stopped pushing water back in because so much water is taken out of those rivers to irrigate farmland. And the last one is um, the example of the Ganges Basin. Deforestation in this area has caused more flooding because the water isn't being absorbed anymore by vegetation. I hope that's been helpful. And if you go now to video two, which is about ocean currents.